this uh we have these amazing bodies uh, we can do all kinds of tricks with them if, if you put us in a sensory deprivation tank uh, the vast majority of human beings are going to start seeing things and hearing things they just are that's the way our body works um, so there, there's a thousand things that are really weird that we can do uh, really weird uh, meditation states for example are very very strange things and uh, some of them are really potent and powerful now um, I don't take any of that as self-explanatory or as epistemologically clear. I don't think people know they don't have grounds to trust the thoughts that they have in those states. Um, therefore, there's a great challenge. How do you understand those extreme moments, those intense moments of human experience that are so important to us, that orient us often? You know, you have a near-death experience and forever after your whole life is built around that experience. But how do you know whether you can trust them? And how do you know the sense in which you can trust them and the sense in which you need to hold them at arm's length and criticize them? How do you know that it's smart to take your moral bearings from them and so on? They are the sorts of questions that are taken up in that book. Isn't the answer that you never know? I mean, you never, you can never, I mean, any kind of, st strictly speaking, any kind of strange experience, you, you at least can't take for granted its truth. You would at a minimum have to subject it to some kind of analysis. Right. Correct. You can't take it for granted. But I think uh, as a fallibilist and pragmatist, I don't think you ever know anything for sure. But I do think you can build confidence in certain beliefs that you think or, or, or decrease confidence in certain beliefs. So what you're doing is playing with the plausibility structure surrounding the belief that you endorse based on an experience. The more you understand the experience, the more you impact the plausibility of the beliefs that you formed around it. So I've had friends who've had profound mystical experiences who immediately connect them with the religious tradition from which they belong. And it's uh, the convictions they have from those experiences are held with almost infinite strength. They're just unshakable. But I've also had friends who don't have religious upbringing who've had similar experiences. And for them, it's a great puzzle. They don't know what to do with it. They want to understand it. It's happened to them. It feels important, but they don't know how to make sense of it. And the wisdom traditions of religion help to help people discern, I think, how to understand what to trust in those experiences and what not to. It turns out that it's not the skeptics about religious experience that have pushed uh, skepticism the strongest. It's the, it's the discernment traditions in religious traditions that have pushed it strongest. So the senior Buddhist overseer of young monks who are practicing, sitting, right, who are meditating, that's the person who pushes skepticism harder than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. And they, they do so with a tremendous amount of concrete experience in mind. And they know when experiences are delusory to some extent. At least they're able to recommend a way of thinking about it. Yeah, I would think that's better developed in some of the Eastern traditions than in uh, some of the Western, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I don't know if you're right about that. In the Western contemplative traditions, there are incredibly rich discernment practices as well, often handled in communities in the same way that it's done in a Buddhist monastery. Uh, but... Um, What's, what's different is that there is in the South Asian traditions particularly incredibly refined discussions of meditation states that we don't find anywhere in the West. Mm -hmm. We don't find it in the Eastern traditions either. We find it especially in the South Asian tradition, South Asian Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, that, that's distinctive. But the discernment practices are actually pretty common and the criteria that are used in trying to discern whether it's smart to believe something that you're inclined to believe based on a religious experience. Those, those discernment criteria are pretty similar across cultures. Okay, maybe we can uh, try to come up with an example of an experience where, where ultimately discernment practices uh, would be useful. And maybe the way to start is, you know, you said you've had friends who had experiences that were not in the context of a specific religious tradition. Uh, are, can you describe uh, what, uh, one such experience or a kind of experience? Uh, and it might be an experience that had they had it within a religious tradition, you think they would have attached, you know, some of that uh, furniture to it. But, but, but are there, you know, I mean, what's an example of a kind of experience somebody might report to you? So um, uh, most people, when a loved one dies, a loved one to whom they're very close and they've been involved with, they, um, the, the, about half of them experience the presence of that person afterwards. 
They don't normally talk about it. You need to do your surveying very carefully to get to that number because they're ashamed or shy or worried that people think they're crazy or something. But they hear them or they see them or they sense, or they sense their presence. Now, um, those ex that's a class of experiences I'm talking about, but I know a bunch of people who've had experiences like that. Now, those people um, in, in, are, are often inclined to believe in ghosts after an experience like that. That's the temptation. There's got to be some kind of discarnate entity there or there's some type of spirit world that's capable of communicating to me in this period after, after the loved one's death. Uh, the discernment practices kick in at that point uh, really strongly. Uh, what do we know about uh, auditions or visions or senses of presence? We know that the brain's got this incredibly sophisticated simulation machinery that we make sense of the world all the time in part by synthesizing a model of the world in our minds well we we can do that as well with things that are not present that's how we picture harry potter and the lord of the rings you know and we can do it in uh, in such a way under the right circumstances that the that we actually create a sense of presence or we have the feeling subjective feeling that we're hearing a voice or seeing something now, um, mentally unstable people do that, of course, which is why people are so shy to talk about these things. Ordinary healthy people experience it as well under special extreme circumstances. So I would say um, there are two things you can learn from that, drawing on that body of wisdom. One is you cannot trust beliefs that you get based on that experience. It does not mean that your loved one exists somewhere and is trying to communicate with you. And two, um, the fact that you've got this web of love and concern that stretches so powerfully into your life like that is a reminder to keep alive this uh, respect for your ancestors and your loved ones and to carry forward their life projects to the extent that you can in your own life. Uh, I, these, I would say these are two inferences that you can draw that are stable and sound and fit both with most traditional religious traditions, uh, traditional religions, and fit also with the best of what we know from contemporary science. Right. In fact, I'd say much of the discernment you you employed there comes from science, right? Uh, the first half does, uh, but not only from science. Uh, the, the Buddhist monks know a ton about delusional thinking and meditation. They know a ton about appearances, auditions, uh, uh, visions. The, 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 there are a whole bunch of Buddhist practices that lead directly to experiences like that for people who are prone to them. That's why the Dalai Lama, when he's doing his... Uh, or Tibetan Buddhism in general, when they're doing these great big retreats, um, they actually ask you psychiatric and psychological questions and they warn you that there are side effects of this type of practice. So there's a tremendous amount of experience encoded in traditional religions about how to manage the unruly and strange, unpredictable, unfamiliar aspects of human brain functioning. Mm -hmm. 